Hello, hello, this is the Digital Loop, Season 3, Episode 20, and actually the last episode of the season. You'll understand why next season. Uh, we have a guest today. Hi, Alex. Hello, guys. Hello, Loopers. <laughs> Hi, Ivan. How are you? Hi, Paul. Hi, Alex. Yes, Alejandro Barrera is back on the Digital Loop. We remember we have Alex on Season 1. Um, live, today, live, from, live from Madrid, live from Madrid, all the way from Madrid. I'm the only one back, you know, you guys are like already at 9 a.m. It's 8, 8, 8 a.m. for me, uh, just <laughs> having my first coffee. Uh, we wanted to talk today about the future of conferences. Alex is part of the team of Tech.eu. There was an article that was written about Web Summit that made two articles, actually, because it was a follow-up. They made a huge, huge amount of noise about the way uh, conferences are, uh, are run. Uh, we might not go... In the article, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes, obviously, but we want to talk a little bit about conferences in general because we had some cool conversations with Alex because it's true that there's a lot of, lot, a lot of conferences happening. There's a lot of techniques that we invite uh, uh, guests and speakers to conferences, and sometimes as well, we, the three here, and some of the people listening to us have a different view of conferences because we are speakers uh, than the regular attendees are, that come. So this is a bit of the idea of the next 20 minutes. Uh, I don't know who wants to start with that one, either Ivan or Alex. Go ahead, take it up. One. Yeah, I mean, well, a very, very good point that you mentioned. I mean, I, I often, as as some of you know, um, Alex, Paul, and I, we are frequently uh, speaking at different conferences, and very often we get uh, uh, we would ask, uh, you know, would you recommend go to that event, or what do you think about that event? And very often, as Paul mentioned, is, is the experience that you have as a speaker can be a completely different speaker uh, experience as you have as a, as a guest. There are events that, as a speaker, I'll recommend you 100% to go because it's fun, because there is a lot of extracurricular events, because there is a lot of attention paid to the speakers. However, when you look at the value given by the conference, if I was an attendee, I don't think I would pay all that money to go to such events. So this is one of the things that we want to also discuss about how, what is the real value when it comes down to conferences and events? Uh, because it's not as clear as, as, you know, you come to this fantastic event because all the movers or shakers are here and you have to be here. And then you get there and then the value that you get might not be uh, as, as, as obvious as, as they promote in their marketing practices. So let's, let's 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 ask one mover. Let's uh, ask one mover and shaker, Alex. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's a pretty obvious question that very few conferences really ask themselves, which is, what kind of value are we delivering? I mean, why do we exist in the first place? Are we a conference that it's designed to have our friends on the speaker world party, or is it really a conference that helps uh, seasoned entrepreneurs? Is it a conference that helps uh, newbie entrepreneurs, first-time startups coming into the space? So I think that's the first question that most kind of events have to ask themselves. And my feeling is that we're seeing something very similar to what we've seen in the accelerator world, where there's this copycat kind of mentality. It's like, now you have to have a conference with 45,000 people, with this kind of speakers, with uh, parties, with this and that. And so this, this notion of cargo cult that's happening in events, that's been <laughs> happening for, for a while, uh, that I believe it's, it's detrimental for the whole ecosystem. So, you know, I don't want to get back into the article, but the whole point of the article wasn't to trash Web Summit, but actually to highlight to everyone the real problem that's happening. And Web Summit are definitely not alone within their, their shady marketing or aggressive marketing techniques, but a bunch of other companies. Yeah, yeah, because you mentioned, so hold on, because you mentioned the, this is a different, to uh, different topic, this is a, something that's linked to it, is the way as well these are advertised be, be, beyond the value that the conference offers and arguably Webit, uh, Webit, sorry, Web Summit uh, offers uh, value. It's true that the way it's been marketed has been bashed, but these, these, they are by far not alone. The number of emails you can get either as someone who's in the circuit or, or as an early stage startup, I've asked some of the startup advice, the number of emails they get is crazy. It's not the email, it's the way they are sometimes written, the way they are supposedly invited and then they have to pay for the privilege actually or something like that. This is, especially because again, me, if, if I'm being asked to be 
to pay, I'll be I'll be fine with that. I can, I can put it on my expenses of my company. It's fine. As an early stage company, it's a very different ball game because you have a limited amount of resources you can put into marketing and, and networking. Thus, you have to make a good choice. So, how can you make that choice? So, do do you think there is something to be done here, Alex, or not? Well, I think there's a couple of things to be said here, and and uh, we, we've talked about this before. A lot of people argue that because a conference has to be a successful business, has to be a business, and has to make money, uh, that gives them license to do this kind of techniques. Now, uh, I always give this metaphor is obviously a drug cartel also has to make money. It is a business. <laughs> now, the point here is which one do you prefer, a legitimate business or a drug cartel business? So I, I think this is the big discussion is, yes, obviously it is a business, but there's ways and ways of doing business. Now, connecting to what you were saying, what can be done? Um, you know this this quote that has been going around for, for quite uh, like a couple of years that, uh, from uh, Mark Andresin, where he said, software is going to eat the world. Um, I truly believe that right now we are entering, well, not entering, we are already into it, but that it, this it's becoming very apparent that data is really what's going to eat the world. Now, I truly think that the major issue with most conferences is, is a dual problem. First is they don't know how to generate value. And conferences are becoming so complex because the startups and the attendees that come into the conferences have very different requirements than the ones that they had like five, ten years ago. That it's becoming extremely complicated to generate value manually for these people. And on the other hand, you have the issue of even if you identify the kind of value that you can give, that you tried and you've tested it and it works, then you need to deploy it physically on a physical conference. And I think those two areas are the ones that we're seeing a major lag on most conferences. There is no data-driven decisions on how to generate value, not marketing, but actual value. You know, how to do the matchmaking. You know, if you go to Tinder, if you go to match.com, there's a lot of algorithms behind it that do the matchmaking between people. Why don't we do ha why don't we have that in a conference? But don't you think because the, the one reality with conferences is that it's actually extremely hard to make money. A lot of conferences actually run as side projects by companies that want to do their own marketing. That's a way to market themselves. That's one type of conferences. Another type of conferences are having a really hard time to to raise enough money from sponsorship and then of course enough money from ticket uh, ticket prices with all the costs that are incurred. I'm not saying all of them. But it, it's a it's a tough business. I mean, I, I've organized some conferences myself. It's a tough business. So, how can you scale a conference uh, and thus arrive at a level you're telling me to, to do, where it's basically hire data scientists, which, by the way, I hear Web Summit is doing, whilst having the issue of maybe not having enough uh, uh, cash flow to do so. Well, I think essentially there's like two models. So either you go to the massive model where we go into the long tail, so we get a lot of people there, and they, we don't charge them, and we base our business model on sponsorship and someone eventually buying the conference. The problem with scale, as we all know, and it's a social effect, is that the more scale you put, the more the quality gets diluted, because the quality remains constant across the spectrum. It's just like the more you put, the, the, the more diluted it becomes. Now, I don't have anything against that. I personally don't like that. I'm not a person that likes you know, big, massive conferences. Paul, you and I uh, have talked about this before uh, on, on the reasons why we stopped going to South by Southwest were precisely this one. Now, on the other hand, you have the extremely private, elite vertical conferences where, you know, the, uh, the margin that you get per attendee and speaker is massive. I'm, I truly believe in that model much more than the other one. It's smaller, it's easier to handle. Your costs tend to be lower because you require a smaller team to run it. And then with a smaller sample, you can actually do a lot of very interesting stuff with data. Yeah, but then then you don't, uh, I'm sorry, because you tend to arrive at these conferences, some of them are invite only. It's true, they are very, very, very high quality. But again, we fall back into the three of us here will be invited because we're already known. 
if I'm 18 and I'm just launching a startup, how do I get to the point of being on the radar to, of those guys to be once invited? Some of them are making you know, efforts to reach out. Some of them are inviting the companies they've invested in, for instance. But it's, it's hard. As, a, as an early stage startup, as a company that doesn't have much money, how do you get noticed? How do you get, and especially how do you get to talk to someone like Alex? How do you get to talk to, to, to VCs, et cetera, at conferences? This is a bit, the tough bit for, for them, no? Well, I, I think that people have a weird idea of what an elite conference is. I mean, the, the, the problem comes with the word. The word elite doesn't mean that it's just a bunch of people that are our friends, which is sadly the, the, the model that we've traditionally seen. But it's more about the fact is that it, there's a reduce a cap on the conference. So there's like 150 attendees, and there's 150 attendees. So a bunch of them obviously would be people that are known to the network of the conference uh, organizers. But a bunch of others should be new. There was this notion of uh, that they talk a lot about in, in lean uh, circles, which is when you do like a, an open mic session and you have people coming to the stage to just give the first talk, a talk, like improvising the talks. The problem you have, and and I've talked with organizers about this, is the best times or the, in the best situations that this works are the the times when they've curated the audience. And by curation, doesn't mean that it's just my friends, but actually a very healthy mix of new people coming into the stage, veterans coming into the stage, people that can deliver, people from the corporate ecosystem. So I, I think people don't tend to focus that much on the composition of the audience and tend to focus too much on the speaker lineup. And the party. Yeah, because they because they're hoping that a good speaker lineup will, of course, attract then good audience. And uh, and and maybe you also say that because that's also the case for bigger conferences. There's a break point. They need that yeah. many people to actually break break even. Yeah, but, uh, but okay, well, I I just wanted to raise connected with the element of the of the speakers. I mean, a, a mistake that I see time and time again many many events organizers making is the fact that very often they are focusing on just being bringing the big names or bringing people from big companies that are very well known, regardless of how good this person is as a speaker. Uh, and and yeah, but, I had uh, sorry to interrupt you, is also because that sells tickets because then you advertise that someone for Uber, someone for Facebook, someone from Google is there. Then people from the corporate world, because these are the guys who pay the tickets, will yes, say, oh, there's Google, oh, there's Uber, oh, there's Facebook, that's I'm going. If there's someone which might be, unless he's written or she's written a book, maybe <laughs> No, it sells tickets, but we go back again to the element of what value are you giving? I've been to events that you have the president and CEO of a whatever company, and you go arrive and you sit down, and it's a 15-minute presentation showing videos and ads of their company. And no, no, we've no always. We're, no, I'm sorry. I was trying to be the devil's advocate. We've all been there. It's just that it's yeah, from the conference point of view, they have a hard time. Then uh, you know, if they only get lower names, which might be known to only certain circle, they might not fill the seats. Well, or then they choose to do like what Alex is proposing: well, limit I, the number I, of people. I think there's a quote that that defines this situation very well. Is when you have big conferences, you have to feed the beast. And feeding the beast means that even if I have 80% of the speakers that are amazing within their own circles, you still need 20% of superstars to drive traffic. I saw this yesterday. Um, uh, just full disclosure, the South Summit is a customer of my company. And I was there running the main stage. And it was interesting to see how the moment we had a panel with all the big corporates in Spain, the arena was packed. The moment they left, and the CTO and co-founder of Eventbrite came on the stage. The, the audience, the auditorium was half empty. And it just like shocked me how stupid this kind of uh, fluctuation of audience can be. But this is a reality. There is an audience for superstars. And then there's a qualified audience that is looking for something different. That's why I'm saying that the problem is when you're not curating your audience. It's not within the speakers. It's you need to do a big effort with curating your audience. And obviously, if you have a 25,000 people audience, it's way harder than if you have 350. But then the press uh, might, I mean, we've seen, coming back to Web Summit, they've been very successful at, uh, you know, multiplying. They've got Rise uh, in Hong Kong. They've got uh, Collision in Las Vegas, I think. Uh, they've been very successful at scaling up, which is the, one of the toughest bits of, of conferences, is to scale up. And, the, 
And this is also the reason why then they have a spillover effect of being able to attract bigger names. I think Michael Dell is coming to Web Summit uh, this year, for instance, but also have bigger coverage. CNBC, I mean, the very major outlets. I'm not saying it should be a goal by itself, but you might also end up, as a, as a smaller conference, you might end up being always under the radar, which might be a choice, but also which might be not very rewarding at some point. I don't know. I'm just, again, I'm trying to be the devil's advocate because it's tough to make conferences. Well, I, I'm going to ask you a question. When TED started, when TED Talk started, was an elite event, invite only, and they invited you to pay, like I, I believe it was $6,000. Now, the question is, are they famous or aren't they? No, it's true, but this is, again, coming to the point that we are limiting that to people who have already uh, a net worth, uh, not only in terms of money, but in terms of their own network, in terms of being well-known. Of course, if I, tomorrow if I invite you, the Dalai Lama, and, and, and some you know, very famous speakers, people will talk about it because they have very famous speakers in a secluded area, and I'll say it's like a Davos of tech, or it's a Davos of, H, of X or Y. Again, I'm not criticizing. So... Because we have like seven, eight minutes. What do we see? I mean, the curation of the audience is one. And you mentioned, and I want you to go a little bit further than that, you mentioned the use of data. So what do you see could be a future for conferences? And what would you advise? Let's say I'm a new guy trying to make a conference uh, wherever in Europe or in the US or in Asia, and I'm hiring you as uh, my consultant to help me set it up. What would you advise me to do? So for me, essentially, there's two points that I've, personally experienced through this two years working with South Summit that has been particularly uh, insidious in terms of having to do it by hand. The first one is at South Summit, and I believe in other conferences happens the same, we do a very big effort on really scouting the Southern European ecosystem. So we physically go to each city, we physically give talks there, we go nearly, if, and this is not an exaggeration, the people that have met us during our trips know this, we literally go startup by startup, betting them and talking to them and seeing which ones make sense and inviting them. Now, that effort is massive. It, it takes us six months of the year, at the beginning of the year, to do that. Now, I truly believe that while there's still a very powerful human element there that you still need to keep, and that's why scaling this kind of quality-driven conferences are, is so hard. I still believe that there's a, a place for data there to do uh, predictive scouting and identifying startups beforehand. So I'm not advocating for not doing the effort of manually going or physically going, but actually enhancing that effort with data. And the other part is once you have the a curated audience, once you have a curated group of startups, corporates, investors, and you know uh, stakeholders coming to the conference. Now the question is, how do you mix them together? And here we, we can open a big can of worms here, a Pandora box, because there's a myriad of startups trying to do networking apps and things like that. But I still believe that if we had enough information from each side, if you could actually assess giving a startup, OK, these guys are early stage. They need a seed round or they need a Series A round in six months. These are the kind of spaces that they're touching. These are their competitors. This is what they're looking for. And then on the other hand, do the same thing with investors. Analyze their portfolios automatically. Analyze the corporate portfolios automatically. And we can cross-reference this. You can end up creating a virtual agenda, a virtual schedule for these people to connect and like really highly targeted connections between each of them. Now, I, I agree because uh, it's true that you just, and I'll, I'll let you finish, you mentioned the term automatically. And most of the times when you've been asked to, uh, to, to use an app, a networking app, you have, to, you have your basic information and you have to, you can import your LinkedIn profile, which might not have all, for instance, for VCs, all their portfolio. You might, and it's, it's a bit limiting. It's true that, and I understand the privacy concerns on the other hand, but it's true that if that was done beforehand and in, in the background, that would help a lot because it would, it would surface you the kind of people you might be interested in Instead of most of the time when I go to these apps, I look at where are my friends, which is fine, but it doesn't really help because it's just meeting you again, which I really like to hang out with you, but I don't meet new people. You know that? But, you know, but I mean, honestly, I think you're right. The automatic part might yeah. be something that is really and, important. Uh, plus, think about the, the extra features. And this is what I told a lot of people when we were on the tour. I, I bumped into startups, and I asked them, what are you looking for? And they told me, we're looking for this, that, and that. And I said, then don't come to this conference. And they were shocked. <laughs> they were expecting me to tell them, 
you know, come whatever, you know, by any means possible. I said, don't come. This is not a conference for you. You're not going to find these things here. So I think it's also a way of informing the audience of who should come and who shouldn't come and why. You know, now obviously this whole thesis rests on a bunch of data and a bunch of hypotheses that need to be tested. So I'm not saying it's there yet whatsoever, and I'm not by any means saying it's easy because it's not. But for me, I think that's going to be the frontiers of what's going to differentiate uh, conferences in the future. Intelligent smart conferences that are intelligent about the kind of speakers they, 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 they bring, that are intelligent about the kind of audience they invite, that are intelligent about how they do the scouting, and mix all that together to really deliver value in a highly competitive space that keeps getting more and more competitive. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I also think that is important, and this is something that is applicable not just for conference organizers, but for every single business, is you know you need to ask yourself when 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 you're talking about growth, when you're talking about scaling, are you getting bigger to get bigger, or are you getting bigger to get better? Because the problem that I see with these events is that the 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 goal, the objective, is to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then as you mentioned, the quality. Uh, uh, it's watered down. So uh, think about if you want to really get bigger, is it because we want to add more value or just because we want to try to get more corporate uh, money or sponsors or be able to say we got 1,000 or 2,000 people in our event? Uh, because it makes a difference in the, in the long term. Uh, so maybe you'd ask the question, do you guys think that uh, virtual reality will replace all this because at some point is it necessary to meet people or not? Hmm. That's I'm not talking about Google Plus because that's one thing, but I'm talking about true, a more immersive experience of uh, attending a uh, conference. Uh, virtually. Well, maybe not, maybe not re connected directly with virtual reality, but th there is this, this, there is a lot of events that are actually, you know, virtual. That basically you are, uh, you know, I connect, I, I pay my fee, and I'm sitting down here in my office. Yeah, and but I'm, I'm watching. The, you're the watching. Yeah, else. But you're watching the conference, but you're not really interacting with your fellow attendees, whereas virtual reality could. So, do you think? Yeah. Do so okay. you think it could actually lead to that at some point? I think Dean is going to love this, this, this <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, I was recently reading a fantastic recap on the, on the last uh, Oculus Connect conference. And uh, we're talking about the integration of Minecraft with uh, Oculus and, and VR. And there was a word that I loved that they were using, which is this beginning of connecting Minecraft with virtual reality is b the beginning of the metaverse. And, uh, I, 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 I've experienced Oculus, and I've experienced Minecraft, and I can only say that I'm really excited to see that, because for once, uh, there's a truly human experience behind that. And the person that was talking about this had a very good definition. He said, it's the first time I'm having memories and experiences about my uh, behavior within Minecraft. I'm dreaming about the experiences I've had within this kind of specific... Uh, environment and laboratory we're, we're creating. So I, I do believe that we're finally mimicking the kind of interactions that are necessary or are social and human in nature that is the kind of things that we crave when we go to a conference. So I do believe we're getting there. It's probably not there, especially you know when it comes with the way you in interface and interact with people. I mean, the thing about human interactions is that you cannot listen to more than two people at the same time. Now, with digital worlds, you can have three, four, ten digital feeds coming to you at the same time, and be and turn. It turns out you you end up becoming overwhelmed by that. So, I'm curious to see how can we restrict the power of digital to, let's say, uh, couple it with how humans behave, because I think that's a the, the limiting factor here is not digital; it's human. Well, on those words, because we're running out of time, uh, thank you so much, Alex, for being with us once more. Uh, you might yeah. be with us again next season. It's going to be slightly different. You'll see, guys, we're changing a little bit the format. Uh, bye, guys. Bye, Ivan. Bye, Loopers. Pleasure, guys. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye-bye.